Did you just get some blood work back showing you have elevated iron levels? Maybe you're worried about iron overload or other things related to iron overload. Well, it's important to understand that what you eat can make a huge difference. And it's not just about cutting out red meat. There are hidden iron traps that people often fall into and definitely powerful iron blocking foods that you need to know about to optimize your health if you're having iron overload. Iron is an essential nutrient and our bodies definitely need it, but too much can be damaging to your liver, your heart and many other organs in your body. And today we're going to explore five food categories to understand if you're battling iron overload. And we'll reveal the foods that can naturally lower your iron absorption. And it's really about taking control of your iron levels through your diet. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Terranella and this channel is all about helping you optimize and improve your health. Today we're tackling too much iron and iron overload. If you're liking these videos and getting a lot out of these videos, click on that like and subscribe to continue getting videos like this. So iron overload is a double-edged sword. We definitely need it to do things like make red blood cells and carry oxygen throughout our body, but excess iron can act as a pro-oxidant and cause damage to our tissues through free radical production. And iron overload is typically caused by conditions like excess iron accumulation from genetic disorders like hemochromatosis. Sometimes low iron states can lead to excess iron. And some liver diseases can also lead to problems with iron regulation. And then there's also a fourth category, which is basically overconsumption of iron. Maybe you're doing a diet like carnivore diet and you have more subtle genetics for hemochromatosis. Maybe you don't have full-blown homozygous I guess genetic alterations, but you have enough that have a little bit more iron absorption. On top of that, you're eating excess iron in your diet, leading to this iron accumulation. And so the problem then is that iron overload often develops silently. You don't know you have it until the symptoms become really overt or someone does a lab test and sees that your ferritin is 500, 600, 800, or even more. Or on the other hand, it can develop after significant damage. For instance, you may find that you have problems with high liver enzymes or damage to your liver or problems with diabetes and blood sugar imbalances. And these issues can be directly tied in with iron overload, which is one of the reasons why we want to manage this problem and keep it in check. You can develop liver cirrhosis and even liver cancer from ongoing excess iron accumulation. There's also issues with your heart, like arrhythmias that can develop, diabetes due to damage to the pancreatic cells. More commonly is joint arthritis and pain in various joints. And then also fatigue and weakness can also occur as that iron is damaging our tissues. And we can think of the iron accumulation in the body with hemochromatosis and iron overload as adding too much heat to a body that definitely needs to have some heat in it so as not to get too much dampness and damage to the underlying structure of that house. But if you provide too much heat, it's going to start to damage the structure of the house. So really the problem or mistake here is that many people are at risk for iron overload or actually have iron overload and have no idea. They may consume iron-rich foods or supplements and that's unknowingly making their symptoms worse. Or in some cases, they do know that they have this problem or at risk for this, but they're basically just avoiding red meat or instead of eating red meat five days a week, they're eating it four days a week. And they're overlooking a whole broad spectrum of dietary things that they could be doing to lower the risk and reduce the amount of management that they need to do on a daily basis. And I think it's quite common to have a general lack of awareness about the risks of iron overload. Many often think about iron deficiency, but not so much iron overload. And oftentimes we don't really equate the different iron sources like plant iron versus heme iron. That's going to be more in animals. We think, well, it's all pretty much iron, so it's the same. And we also don't think about how combining different foods can either increase or decrease the amount of iron that you're going to absorb from any given meal. And so that's what we're going to look at in this video is how you can optimize your dietary strategies to minimize the amount of iron that you're accumulating and reduce your overall iron overload state. So let's dive into those specifics. So with this dietary approach, it is really a bit of a balancing act and it's important to recognize both sides. You know, we do need protein sources and we do need to limit the iron absorption. And it's really not about just eliminating all iron sources, although that strategy can work for some people. Most people don't want to give up all their protein sources. And so with that, it's important to recognize that different animal sources and different plant sources are going to have more or less iron in them. 
depending on what you choose. And so heme iron foods are going to be basically any animal-based proteins, but some of those animals are going to have more iron in them than others. And so the way I like to think about it is if an animal has four legs, it's going to have more heme iron in them versus one that have two legs or no legs like a fish. So the most significant sources of iron in terms of protein are going to be beef, lamb, even venison is going to have higher amounts of iron when compared to things like turkey and chicken. And these animals tend to have more blood in them, and that's called heme iron. And the heme iron is more readily absorbed by the body across the board, whether you have hemochromatosis genetics or not. Organ meats equally, not a lot of people eat organ meats, but if you are, Consuming those, those would be something you'd want to avoid if you have iron excess or iron overload states like kidney, livers, these types of things. And these are also available in supplement form. And so you'd equally want to avoid those types of supplements. Sometimes foods are also fortified with iron. So these can be grains like breads and cereals. And many of these are not going to have tons of iron in them, but they are going to be fortified with non-heme iron. And so it's important to look at the labels for those in terms of milligrams. Sometimes can be equivalent to what you would take in a supplement. And if you're eating this kind of food on a daily basis and you have genetics or problems with iron accumulation, you may be further amplifying this issue. There's also certain foods or supplements that can enhance how well your body is absorbing iron. So these are mostly going to be like consuming vitamin C or vitamin C rich foods, such as citrus, berries, tomatoes, and even peppers. And so it's going to enhance the non-heme based iron absorption and also can increase the absorption of, of heme iron as well. Simple sugars like fructose and sucrose or table sugar has also been shown to increase iron absorption or stimulate more absorption of iron in some research studies. Equally, alcohol also has been shown to increase the amount of iron absorption from food and it's thought to occur via opening up the gap junctions in the intestines due to inflammation from the alcohol you're absorbing more of the iron from the foods that you're eating. Some people don't think about cast iron pans as a significant source of iron, but they definitely are. And if you already have iron overload, you definitely want to avoid cooking with those types of pans. So those are kind of the foods that you want to naturally just avoid most of the time. And we'll get into some strategies on how to maybe pair those with the second category of foods. And that is the foods that are going to lower your iron absorption. These foods are going to contain compounds that basically bind to the iron in the gut, basically reducing the ability of the body to take that through the intestines into your body. So foods like dairy products or fortified plant milks, leafy greens, you know, basically a lot of things that have calcium in them, the calcium can inhibit both the heme and non-heme absorption. And so if you consume these with iron rich foods, you're going to lower the amount of iron that you're accumulating with each meal. Phytates and phytic acid containing foods are going to be things like nuts and legumes and whole grains. And these are going to bind to and inhibit the absorption of iron as well. A lot of times when people are making beans, they'll soak them for a period of time and that basically removes the phytic acid. And when you do that, you're going to increase the amount of iron absorption. So in cases where you have iron overload, you want to keep those phytates in the food and you don't want to soak them. Polyphenol rich foods like teas, coffee, cocoa, berries and different spices are going to have tannic acid and other polyphenols in there that are going to bind to the non-heme iron in the gut and prevent its absorption similar to the calcium and phytic acid. And it's important to note with these strategies of trying to reduce the iron absorption that you take these at the same time or at least close to the meal. Otherwise, you're going to reduce the iron blocking effect. They need to be present in the digestive tract, in the stomach at the same time so that they can bind to the iron to prevent it from absorbing. If you wait like two hours after the meal to consume your tea or coffee, that's pretty much too late and it's not going to have hardly any effect. It needs to be within 10, 15 minutes of the food or at the same time. Now, of course, you still need to consume protein. And as we mentioned earlier, things like chicken, fish, and turkey in moderation are going to be much better options here. With your fruits and vegetables, you definitely want to be mindful of which fruits and vegetables have higher vitamin C content and try to minimize when you're having those close to iron rich foods, especially if it's the four legged animals. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have these independent of those four legged animals. Let's say you have a breakfast with like yogurt and berries. That would be perfectly fine. But you wouldn't want to have berries with your beef, for instance, or peppers and beef because that vitamin C in those peppers is going to help that iron absorb even more. 
And it's important to note too that most iron is absorbed in the proximal part of the small intestine, so the upper part of the small intestine. And so that's why the timing really matters. If you wait too long, like more than 30 minutes or so, some of that iron is already going to be absorbed through the duodenum. So the best strategy is about limiting your heme iron from those four-legged animals, being mindful about fortification in foods that you may like to eat, certain grains, for instance, and strategically combining other foods that are going to bind to the iron and prevent it from absorbing into your body. But it's also knowing and understanding your personalized risk, like for hemochromatosis or other iron-related problems that are making your iron levels higher than they should be. A lot of times people just think, well, I'm going to avoid the four-legged animals and cross my fingers, hope for the best. And while that's not a terrible strategy, it's sometimes not enough. And you do need to be, have some careful monitoring, especially when you have genetic hemochromatosis, so that you can kind of customize and tailorize your diet to minimize the risk. Remember, it's not just about the hard outcomes of the ferritin and iron saturation. When you do the test, it's what's happening day to day. So the more times you can run some experiments and then test your levels and understand how your diet choices that you're making are impacting that, the less damage or problems you're going to have over the long run. This isn't about the next week or next month. It's about the next 10, 20, 30 years. And so that's why you want to see your doctor and get some regular testing for things like your serum ferritin, which is the stored iron. And we want to make sure that's not going up over time. And when it is, there are certain steps you're going to want to take, including some of the ones that we discussed here. And then, of course, the big one is also going to be the transferrin saturation, the serum iron, total iron binding capacity. All these are going to help triangulate what's going on with your overall iron levels in your body and how quickly it's accumulating, or is it staying the same or going down. If you haven't had a hemochromatosis test yet, this can be really helpful too in understanding how much calibration you need. Sometimes people are just consuming lots of iron-rich foods over 10, 20 years, and that's really their problem. They don't have genetic hemochromatosis, or maybe they have a mild version. On the other end, you may be fairly young and have major hemochromatosis genetics, and in that case, you want to put more emphasis on some of these preventative strategies. And that's going to include things like regular blood donations or phlebotomy. Sometimes it might include iron chelators if you have extremely high levels. And of course, these dietary strategies. But how much of this you need for your unique situation is going to be different, even if you have the same genetics as someone next to you. And there's lots of different things that influence that. But the main thing is checking your levels enough times to know how you can tailor or customize your diet to minimize the impact, the long-term impact of this oxidative stress on your tissues. Just a quick note too, I do have other videos on iron accumulation and iron overload, and I think these are helpful to check out. And if you just go to the playlist, you'll find a whole host of iron accumulation and iron overload videos that will help you better understand this topic. So now that we got the details of this problem kind of hammered out, or hopefully you have a better understanding, let's discuss some of the key takeaways that I think are important for managing this moving forward. The main one is that iron overload can cause serious damage to your tissues and organs. And even though you may not be having serious problems right now, maybe perhaps you do, but this thing happens over time. And it is fairly manageable when you take some of these things into consideration that I'm explaining here. There, of course, are genetics that we think genetics, once you have that, it's sort of destined to be. But just because you have genetic hemochromatosis, which is the most common cause and contributor to this, doesn't mean that you're predestined to always have to donate blood. These dietary strategies can really change how often you need to donate blood, and some people don't even have to. Remember that your heme iron and the four-legged animals are going to have more heme iron, but that's the most readily absorbable form of iron. So when you're calibrating your diet, that's the one you want to be most mindful of. And certain foods and nutrients can work as anti-nutrients and reduce the absorption of that heme iron. So if you're at risk or already know you have iron overload, you definitely want to limit your red meat and be mindful of iron-fortified foods. You also want to avoid organ meats at all costs and strategically combine your food so that you're reducing the iron absorption. You also want to be careful about consuming alcohol in relationship to your foods and also avoid cast iron cooking. Another strategy that I like to implement with my patients is trying a really strict diet for a period of time where you're avoiding the high 
high iron foods and then checking your iron saturation and ferritin relative to what it has been to see if it stays low or actually goes down is a good tool to help you understand how much iron rich foods you can consume on a daily or weekly basis. Once you understand this baseline, you can then introduce some of those higher iron rich foods. Think more of the four legged animals and also add in some calcium or other foods that have the iron binding capacity. So you limit the amount of iron you're absorbing and then you recheck it. Of course, you're not living in a bottle, so these things can change from one test to the next. But the more you test and try and understand this, the better you're going to be able to optimize your diet for the best outcomes and the less blood donation. And you should always talk to your doctor about personalized guidance about how often you should be doing phlebotomies and how often you should be testing these things and what to do in various scenarios. So of course, iron is key for our bodies as we discussed, and balance is even more important. Too much is a problem, too little is a problem. Problem. And it's not just about avoiding the iron rich foods. It's about figuring out what's going to work best for you based on the foods that you like, but also what your genetics or blood markers are telling you. Hopefully this video helps you better understand the foods to avoid with iron overload and how you can minimize the impact of your diet on iron overload. And if you have questions, you definitely want to drop those in the comment section. But if you're looking for more personalized advice and direct access to health along your health journey, consider joining the membership program we all have more time and attention to dedicate to your questions and you also get early access to some videos and you'll be supporting the work of this channel. Now, one question that I often get is what causes elevated iron saturation or high iron saturation? And you can find the answer to that question in this video 